designer of Wolfgang Borsch was launched onto the game market in the beginning of 2018 with four titles from two publishers, with three of those games going on to be nominated for that year's Spiel des Jahres, Germany's Game of the Year Awards. He's released a number of other titles in late 2018 and early 2019. There have been card games, dice games, medium weight strategy games, and now party games. Yes, with German publisher edition Spiel Visa, Wolfgang Varsh has released Subtext, with Stronghold Games having the English language license. Subtext is an example of a Goldilocks communication party game. I say Goldilocks because you have to communicate not too much and not too little. You have to communicate in just the right amount in order to score the most points and win the game. And this genre has existed for a while. There's different examples of it. The best known might be Dixit from Jean-Louis Rubiera, uh, published by Libelud. So in that game, you get a hand of cards with surrealistic images. You make a sentence based on one of the cards you have, and you put that card on the table. Everyone else puts a card on the table. You mix them all up and reveal them, and people vote on what they think your card is. And if none of the people or all of the people identify your card, then you score no points. So you want to hit this middle ground of having some people identify your card. So you have to be obscure, but not too obscure in what you're trying to say. And there's other examples of this. Uh, Jun Sasaki's A Fake Artist Goes to New York is a mostly cooperative party game where people are collectively drawing an image, except one person doesn't know what they're drawing. They have to try to figure out what they're drawing while also hiding that they don't know. So you. The challenge though is if other people call out the fake artist, if they identify the person who doesn't know what they were supposed to be drawing, but that person can now identify what they were supposed to be drawing, well then the fake artist gets points. So you want to communicate with your drawing, but not too much, just enough so that everyone in the know will be like, yep, 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 I know you're all with me here. So another example of this type of game is Link from Eric Nielsen. There was a German edition with Andrea Meyer doing, getting co-design credit for some changes that were made to the game. And Link is somewhat similar to subtext in that in Link, two people would get the same word and other people would get different words. And then you're giving clue words in two rounds around the table. So I say something, next player, next player, next player, next player. And of course, we don't know who we're partnered with. So if I'm partnered with someone, I don't know if I'm partnered or not. We just get these words. You have to try to figure out who the partners are. And if you are one of the partnership, you have to figure out who your partner is by the clues that you're giving, where you're trying to, again, be clear, but not too clear. So subtext is similar to that, but it uses images instead of words. And that provides a lot more, a lot more wiggle room for what you're doing, at least in theory. Let's show an example of this. Here are the components in subtext. You have a shared point board where everyone will keep track of their score by moving their figure up the track. You have eight figures because subtext is for four to eight players. We'll assume we have a four player game right now and only keep these out. You use tokens in the player colors with each player getting a number of tokens equal to the number of players minus one. So in this case, you have only A, B, and C, which correspond to these spaces on the board. You have paper, which each player gets some. You have pencils, hand those out. And you have decks of cards that show words that people will be drawing over the course of the game. You also have an aid track to keep track of what level of word you are trying to have people guess. Each card in subtext has five words or names on it in the five categories from one to five. And in general, the categories up top will be easier or more concrete items than the items in the fifth level. So how you play is you're going to draw one card if you're the active player. You look at whatever category you're in, probably number one to begin with, so you get good and you have some idea of how this all works. I look at this and then I draw cards equal to the number of players minus two. So in a four player game, I have the one that I looked at. I draw two additional cards. I shuffle them all up and then I distribute one to each other player. And then each player, including me, is going to draw a picture of that word that we saw in our card. So I am partnered with someone, but I don't know who. And our challenge is to find each other. And other players want to find this as well. Once everyone has finished their drawings, you place out the images with the active player placing their image on this side of the board and everyone else shuffling their images and then laying them out in the slots 
based on the number of players in the game. Each player takes their tokens, their A, B, and C tokens, and each player is going to vote on which image they think is paired with the active player. So you take your token, you put it down on the board in front of you, and once everyone has decided, you now have a revelation. So in this case, it's not that difficult to figure out what, the, what person is partnering with the active player. Because here we have uh, a water pump or a heat pump, here we have some glasses, and here we have a whale. And you look on this card here, there's a pirate with a pirate flag and a big old whale in the background. And neither of these two seem likely, so probably everyone's voting for C. And indeed, the card in question was whale. So everyone guessed correctly, which isn't generally good. Scoring in subtext is simple. You must correctly guess who the partner of the active player was in order to score any points. But you may still score no points in that case because the active player and the partner score only if they both guess correctly. So me as the active player guessing correctly on my own doesn't matter, I need my partner to get it too. So I have to communicate in a way that hopefully they will know that they were my partner. But you score points only equal to the number of incorrect guesses. So if we each find each other and we guess correctly, you're my partner, I was your partner, that's great. But if everyone else guesses, we still score zero points. For each other player who was not part, who was not partnered with the active player, if they guess correctly, they get points equal to the number of incorrect guesses plus one point because they were not involved with the equation to begin with. So in this case, the card was whale that the active player had, one of the other players had. Everyone guessed whale, so I didn't have whale. I had grandmother, and I drew the little glasses there with the chain on it. And I was not involved, but I identified whale, whale, so I get a point for that, even though no one else guessed incorrectly. So you're trying to be obscure enough that not everyone is going to get what you're saying. This is the Goldilocks part. I need my partner to cue in to what I am trying to communicate, but ideally only that person because that will maximize my score. Let's give another example. I've zoomed in a bit more to show the next round's drawings. We have the active player with a picture of a Minecraft character, apparently, holding a sword. He's got these big blocky muscles, got a weird grin on its face, got a potion, potion of invisibility, perhaps. I don't know specifically what it is. We have these three drawings over here. We have uh, possibly the thinker. We have a werewolf staring at the moon. At least I would guess it's a werewolf. And then we have something? A cup. And I don't know what that is. I don't know. It's just obscure. But you can look at this and say, well, probably not a sculpture. You build stuff in Minecraft, but probably not this. Okay. But werewolf? Maybe he's fighting here. Maybe they're actually trying to do a fighter and this is a fighter and this is someone you're fighting. Or this is supposed to represent a creeper. Not sure. So this one, uh, it's a cup with liquid and here we have a potion of liquid. Which one would you guess? This is the heart of subtext. You trying to deduce whether you are the partner of the active player. And if not, who is? Of course, if you're the active player, who's my partner? Who, who has the word that I have? I know what that word is, and now I have to try to determine which person is doing an interpretation of that. And that's, that's the fun challenge of the game, trying again to be clear but not too clear. And sometimes things just work out perfectly for you. I played a four player game with some tweens uh, and their dad, and one of the, the kids had misfortune as the active player, by chance, the other tween got it, in misfortune, and they each drew scenes from a series of unfortunate events that they both immediately identified with each other. They knew that. They caught on. And then me and the other dad, we did not get it. Although afterward, I was like, oh, yes, clearly that's Count Olaf, and that's the scene of them on the boat. And, oh. Now I got it, but it was only after the fact. It wasn't immediately apparent to me what they were trying to do. And we've had other instances where it just it clicks, and you can see everyone trying to puzzle it, all, puzzle it all out, while at the same time being completely silent. So subtext, like a lot of party games, has this up-down rhythm where you're chatting, you're doing everything, and then the image come out, images come out and you just have to be like, there's nothing. 
You can't be like, oh, I see. You start revealing things as soon as you start talking about, well, I know it's not, you know, as people reveal things. So you're trying to do it all sort of simultaneously, shuffle the images, no one knows who did what, although of course you start to recognize drawing styles, and then figure things out. We had one interesting one where there was a cake and then there was a snowman. I sort of got that there was frosty or frost with frosting on the cake. With frosty the snowman. There was another image that was sort of the same. Some people are super minimalistic in what they do and others really go all out. So you can be obscure in different ways and it's great seeing the personality of the players in their images and what they're trying to communicate with people. And again, the more that you play with people, the more you can sort of cue in to what they're trying to do. Subtext works well because sometimes party games uh, reward hidden information. So if I, I am playing with my wife, well, of course, we have a lot of time together, a lot of experience that we can draw on for things, but I don't know that she's going to be my partner. So I can't put in something specific to my wife hoping that she's my partner and will clue in to what we're doing and score points. It has to be something that works for everyone. So it eliminates some of those things in games where it feels like there's weird favoritism just by chance with spouses playing together. So one difficulty though, playing subtext is actually seeing the images. Here's the same board zoomed out. I can move the images off the board now because I have more room in the frame to show everything but I'm not sure how well you can actually see the images on these pieces of paper. You're still at a relatively close range given the camera and how I'm focusing on everything. If you are sitting back at a table, it's kind of hard to see what's going on. And I found that somewhat frustrating. So after a while, I pulled out some whiteboards from another game and we just started using those instead because you could see everything and more easily guess and you're not puzzling over what something is, but instead actually playing the game. Plenty of games set up obstacles in them, challenges the players have to overcome in order to succeed. And that is part of the game play, is you figuring out how to overcome this challenge that's presented to you. But seeing the images is not the, the part of subtext that should be challenging. So if you're looking at this or you're looking at this, I think it's pretty clear which one is easier to see from across the table. Now, of course, uh, yeah, this whiteboard is roughly four times the size of this image. And instead of pencil, you're drawing with a black marker and you can more easily see what the things actually are so that you can focus on the challenge of the game. Again, figuring out who is partner with the active player. That should be the focus of the challenge, not trying to you know, lean over and figure out what's going on on here. Now I realize, of course, this game was produced by Edition Spielvisa, a German company. There's gonna be environmental concerns. So yes, we'll include wooden pencils and paper rather than whiteboards and erasable markers that often get thrown away or they go dry on the shelf over a certain period of time. And yeah, there's reasons why you would want to include the material that's included with the game, but it presents an obstacle for play. And I had this statement that came to mind while playing subtext, something that's been in my head more than a decade. So oh, the year was 2005. I was playing Il Principe, a game co-published by Mind the Move and Z-Man Games. It comes in one of those large, like Ravensburger sized boxes or a large Amigo box when Amigo did that thing. And it has a game board that is one box size. It doesn't unfold, it's just the one box size. And then on the board is a map that's about half that. And on that map, there's all these little roadways and there's little spaces in there. And on that map, on those little roadways, you're gonna put these tiny little tokens. And we were playing in my house in Concord, New Hampshire, a hundred year old house with dark wood and not great lighting. And we finished the game and my friend Max said, if I have to squint, I'm not playing. That game is out. Didn't matter that we liked El Principe, never hit the table again because Max was my best friend. We played all the time. And so when Max is over, I knew certain games were just off the table completely because you have to squint. It's a challenge to actually play the game. That was a big barrier. Uh, I was involved with playtesting on Dominion and the cards had this huge typeface. And then the published version had little typeface on a gray background and I just could barely see it. And I think I've played like five times since it was published. 
because I find it hard to see. And of course, I'm now a gamer of a certain age, 51. That's not that old, right? It shouldn't be like trying to take everything and trying to see the, the cards. If I have to do that, then of course I'm impeding gameplay. So you want to be able to facilitate ease of play for all players and ideally the components of a game facilitate that. That's not the case for reasons I can understand, but as well, it made me want to go out and do something different to make sure that we could play more easily. And that's a concern I see addressed uh, from by many gamers across many games where text is too small, icons are too small, I can't see these types of things. It's a challenge for graphic designers to get everything that works as well as possible within a certain price point, within certain manufacturing limits and environmental concerns and all sorts of, you know, shelf packaging, everything has to work together. Sometimes things just don't work quite right. Erasable game boards aren't necessarily ideal for subtext. As you can see from my handling of these images, I've already destroyed them a bit. While filming, you're gonna put everything down on the table. If you rub it a bit on the tablecloth, oh, I've just erased all the image. So you'd have to be careful when playing this way. The boards are color coded. So of course, if I know a certain player is purple and I can watch their reactions, maybe I can determine something about whether they're the partner or not. Whereas the normal images are a little more anonymous in terms of who is contributing what. So they have that advantage with a disadvantage that possibly people can't see them. One other change with subtext is when you add more players to the game, you create a more entertaining game experience because there's more choices available, more puzzling over who has done what, and there are important gameplay results as well. I've played subtext three times on our view copy from Stronghold Games with four, six, and seven players. An interesting thing is the player count changes how many points you can score and creates a different feeling over the course of the game. With four players, the most you can score is four points. If I am not partnered with the active player, but I guess correctly and everyone else guesses incorrectly, four points for me. Three for the incorrect guesses and one for me guessing correctly. If I'm the active player, or the partner of that player, the most I can score is two. We have to guess correctly, and there can be two other incorrect guesses. So the point range, zero to four points on each round of the game. When you have seven players, zero to seven points. So you have wilder swings in the game with people racing ahead or coming up from behind, or of course falling behind, based on the, the number of players in the game. And it creates a more party-ish party game experience just because there's more going on. You feel you had that round where it's just you partnering with the active player and you're the only ones who got it, five points for each of you and no one else scores. And it's just, it's a good rush. You, you just feel great getting to jump ahead of everyone. You feel like you really succeeded more than in a four player game where of course there's just fewer people who, who failed. You want more failure from others that you get to celebrate. There's also just a more interesting dynamic around the table because of course, after you finish the revelation and the point scoring, often you're looking at what everyone else has done. And with more people, you have more styles and more things to guess. So it's the non-game element of the game, which is still fun in its own right. right. The party game is often not about the scoring, it's just the experience of playing. What are you creating out of that? And with more people drawing, you've got this little guessing game at the end. Is that a barbell? Is that a mountain? What were you trying to do? You two really, you drew something completely similar and yet you're, you're both guessers. So I knew you're blah, blah, blah. And you know, you, you have some more table talk about what happened in that particular round and what you deduced and how you figure things out. And of course, that's some of the element, fun element as well. Try to show how clever you are after the round, how I figure things out and, you do all these other elements that are not necessarily part of the actual gameplay, but they create a better experience. So you want more people around the table, but of course the more people you have around the table, the farther you have to sit back from the table in order for everyone to fit around that table, which means you're going to have a harder time seeing the drawings on those little sheets of paper. So ideally you can find some solution that gets lots of people around the table and everyone figuring out what's going on, people with Ideal eyesight, not like me. There you go. Then you have a blast with subtext.